Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I think there was popular support for this talk being in English. Um, not if you're agreeing. Okay. So yeah. Um, hi. I'm Michael. This is Constantine. We are working for TNG. Um, yeah. So basically, first before we start, I would like to ask some questions. Uh, this is for audience participation part. I hope you came prepared. Um, first question: Who has already used Spark? Oh, okay. Cool. Uh, who has already used Spark in production? Not less, nice. <laughs> okay, who has used Flink? And Flink in production? Alright, okay, I sense a pattern here. Alright, <laughs> cool. So, um, this talk is going to be about uh, Spark versus Flink. This is because, I don't know, questions. Um, this is a pretty much, uh, well, personal, perhaps not so much, but uh, we have a background for, to this talk. Basically, um, we inherited a project some time ago and was a big, big mess of big data frameworks. We had everything, we had Scoop, we had Hive, we had Big, MapReduce, everything you, well, everything that has Apache in front of it, we had it. Um, and so we were thinking, okay, uh, let's make this zoo a bit smaller. And we were thinking about uh, finding something that we can use to, to basically just have one tool for everything. And basically our two candidates were Spark versus Flink, or Spark and Flink. Um, and so we put the verses there and decided, okay, let's, let's check which one is better suited to our, to our needs. And this is how the idea for the talk was born. And uh, well, we're TNG, we like to do talks, so uh, yeah, here we are. All right, um, let's just dive in. You're going to see a lot of code. I hope you don't afraid of code. Um, that would be not good. Um, and I will probably talk too much, so uh, Okay, the background. So, um, how does the big data ecosystem look? I mean, I saw a lot of hands, uh, probably everyone is more or less familiar with what I'm going to say, so I want to keep it short. Um, the whole big data ecosystem, at least the open source part of it, uh, started well, with uh, Hadoop. It was basically first invented by, oh, invented, well, first created by Yahoo. Um, actually, Google invented it, just Yahoo did the open source version of it. And it's been a top-level project of, uh, for, in Apache for, uh, for yeah, well, eight years now, so it's a long time. Um, soon after it got out, people started to wonder, okay, is MapReduce everything we can do with it? And so other, well, other um, languages came on, which you could use to write big data, big data programs. For example, Hive and Pig, I think both are the most prominent, especially Hive. Um, it's, well, it's a very popular um, dialect, I think. Uh, which is it's more SQL-like, which I think is better suited to to uh, to, uh, to what people who work with big data uh, knew before the open source projects came out. Big, um, well, it's more of a script language, it also can. The other pattern that evolved, um, people started to use big data for different stuff, like machine learning, for example. So that's how my heart was born and introduced to the Apache um, ecosystem. But also other tools, like Apache HBase, which is also an implementation of a Google paper, um, but also Zookeeper, which basically lets you do certain stuff inside of your cluster, like uh, lead action, stuff like that. 2013 was quite a big year for Hadoop, as you may have heard. Version 2 came out, and version 2 had a pretty major redesign of what uh, Hadoop has been before. Before, Hadoop was basically two parts. You had the distributed data system, and you had MapReduce. Um, with Hadoop 2, it all got split a bit up, so basically the resource manager was pulled out, uh, Jan, um, and MapReduce lost a lot of importance basically for the ecosystem. Um, now you could use other, uh, basically other tools to, um, to write programs for, for your big data analysis. Before, everything, Hive and Pig were just basically translated to MapReduce. Um, yeah. Um, there were also different developments like Storm, which was a real-time framework. Um, so basically, again, a different kind of to work with data or to work with different data than before. Um, and also 2014 was the year of Spark. So the first one of our two tools um, was basically made an Apache top level project and Flink followed shortly after. Okay, I think it was short enough. I think every one of you knew it already. So. Let's go on. So the new guard of this processing tools, uh, which is what we want to call Spark and Flink in this uh, scenario here. Here is a bit of an overview of uh, what these two tools, well, of the most important uh, stuff about the two tools. 
Um, for Spark first, um, yeah, Spark basically was invented in, well, in the Silicon Valley at Berkeley University. Um, it's been in the incubator since 2013, top level since 2014. There is a company behind that, they, uh, well, basically they uh, mostly develop it, provide support and stuff like that. Um, and one, one interesting thing is that Spark's mainly implemented in Scala, which is why also we're basically the main API is Scala. When you have Java, Python, uh, pretty new is R support also. Um, well, you've got what's, what's where you can run Spark is basically you can run standalone. You can make just a cluster where it's only Spark. We can use Mesos, which is actually the birthplace of Spark. So for early on, Spark was just a demo what you could do with Mesos. I think they realized what else you could do with it. EC2 is also very, very neat because uh, people like to, to basically use, uh, use Amazon to, to run big data analysis and the R, of course. Um, and the first thing that you will see when you look at the homepage is lightning fast cluster computing. So at least they get a catchy catchphrase. Okay, Constantine. Yes. Um, so, after, yeah. okay. Um, so Flink is, is pretty similar actually. Um, so it's also been developed at a university at uh, TU Berlin. And actually uh, around the same time as Spark originally. Uh, it was called Stratosphere back then. And when it came into the Apache incubator, uh, it was renamed to Apache Flink. And by now there's also a company behind it, which is basically the research group which originally did Stratosphere, uh, data artisans in Berlin. It's written in Java mainly, there's a Scala part, basically all the Acker stuff is done in, uh, in Scala. Um, deployment options are the same, uh, you can run a standalone Flink cluster, but also on YARN, Mesos, EC2. Um, <coughs> right, and well the teaser is actually not a teaser, it's just a description of what it does. It does scalable batch and screen data processing, so I guess um, yeah, that's not that appealing, but um, it does a job. Yeah, well, at least, at least we got to a nicer logo, so I think we can agree on that. Yeah. So um, let's have a look at um, how Flink is, is built. Um, basically, in the bottom line, you have um, the different uh, deployment options, which is local in your IDE, remote, that's the um, Flink cluster, and you have um, Yarn, Test, Mesos, all that stuff. And the other interesting part, so I'm on the top now. You have the data set and the data stream API. Data set is for batch processing. Data stream is for stream processing. So you basically have two completely separate APIs. And those are basically translated uh, in two different steps, the optimizer uh, and the stream builder. But in the end, you only have the Flink runtime. And the Flink runtime is streaming runtime. So every batch program in Flink which you run is actually a streaming runtime with a fin uh, finite stream and a lot of blocking operations. But in the end, everything is streaming in Flink. On top of the dataset API, you have uh, a graph processing um, library, you have a machine learning library, you have a table API, which is basically a little bit more SQL-like, but still not SQL. And by now, there's also a table API for data stream and um, a complex event processing um, library for the data stream API. Um, those are not in the picture, but they exist. Um, the table API is interesting because it's uh, part of a joint effort of Storm, Samza, and uh, Flink to develop a common stream SQL language. And um, I think Flink has gone the, the furthest there. And I think it's basically they're currently waiting for Apache CalSight to um, continue work, but um, yes. Um, so that uh, rough overview of Flink. Um, yeah. Uh, can you use the data set and the data stream APIs also via Python, as you wrote before, or just via Java and Scala? Um, the Python API in, in Flink is pretty much beta, so I don't think that um, I haven't used it myself. Uh, Java and Scala they support pretty much the same stuff, but um, Python. I suppose it has a lot less functionality and uh, less stability. Um, and well, once zero was released, it has stability for the Scala and the JV, uh, Java API, but not for Python. So um, kind of lagging behind. 
All right, um, let's look at the picture for Spark. Um, it's a bit less uh, full, <laughs> uh, but basically you will see similar things. So for example, you have, um, you have also a graph library, you have machine learning library, so that's kind of the same. The one interesting thing, oh, you have also as well. <coughs> one interesting thing is that Spark builds on top of a REST, and the REST being batch processing. So in, uh, in contrast to Flink, Spark is batch first, actually. And that was also the focus of Spark going in, so uh, it's probably, um, also just straightforward to do that. Uh, that but that has implications for streaming, so it's not real-time streaming as in the Flink, uh, but we will see that later on. Okay, um, yeah, let's just continue. Um, like I said, we, you will see a lot of code, so let's just present to you what the code will look like. Um, <clears throat> when we thought of this talk, we thought, okay, what's mo what realistic use case scenario could we do? And the best we came up with was uh, a real-time analysis of a superhero fight club. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so just imagine you're a superhero and you want to fight other superheroes and you don't know how, so you need an app for that. And this is our app, basically. So you will have a database of superheroes uh, with their stats or something like that, and you will have like fight events when these guys meet and beat up each other. So this is our use case. Um, yeah. All right, so um, to make it more fun, we tried to split up the data and make it a bit more realistic to, to see what we can do with it. Uh, so basically, our static data part, so we will inspect both batch and streaming here. Um, so the static data part will consist of two, two tables, more or less. I think it's pretty small, so let me just read that for you. Uh, we will have a segment table, uh, which contains an ID, um, a name, and basically a segment. So if a superhero is a robot or a human, or whatever you have. Um, and the second table is the detail table and contains the name, the gender, the birth year, and probably the most important of all, the number of appearances, which is in how many comic books this superhero is featured. I think this is pretty important for them. All right. And we combine both. And we make basically, uh, this is what we aspire to do with our two tools, to just basically join these uh, two tables and create uh, one hero data set and just work on it a bit. The second thing will be our stream, and actually our stream will consist of small little fight events, which contain the hitter, the hit uh, hit points, so how hard the hit was hit by the hitter, and of course timestamp, because timestamps are most important in stream processing ever. Um, yeah, and this will happen a lot, so we really let them fight. So, oh, thank you. And yeah, I can get uh, So we have a stream part up here. Oh, and something disappeared. And we have a batch part down here. And now, Constantine will tell you a bit about... Where did we get the data from? Ah, yes, very good question. Um, <laughs> actually, so the data we got was from an um, online uh, page called Comic Vine. They have a massive database of comic book heroes. So if you're interested in very absurd comic book heroes, just look it up there. Very cool. All right, now Constantine will tell you about the technical setup we used. Yes, so this is basically the setup uh, where we, run, uh, we ran our programs on. So the segment and the detail tables were just CSV files uh, on S3. Um, those got combined uh, by, by our Flink and Spark program, um, which ran on uh, EC2. Um, basically, we just um, got some EC2 instances and installed a standalone Flink and a standalone uh, Spark cluster on them. That's the, the batch processing part, the heroes, database was then back stored at S3, uh, on S3. In terms of stream processing, we basically also set up a Kafka cluster on EC2 and um, ran a small data generator and just put a lot of uh, fight events in, into the um, fight event topic. And we, we had to encode them somehow and we, we, we used Afro. Um, so the stream processing part basically reads from Kafka and um, deserializes and then does whatever analysis we are about to do. There will also be a part where we try to combine those uh, results, um, but I guess you will see that later. Ah, right. Um, yeah, we basically we use Java 8 uh, because Java is the, just the m more common language and most people are more comfortable reading Java. And uh, Gradle has a belt tool which doesn't really matter at all. But uh, yes. Um, so, round one is just setting up. So how, how difficult is, uh, is it to get, get started in the different tools? So for Flink, you basically have to, to get some dependencies. Um, is it 
can you actually read it or? Yeah. Okay. So basically, you need uh, three dependencies. Uh, you need the Flink Java, the Flink Streaming Java, if you want to do screen processing, and if you want to be able to, to run it in your IDE, which you will be, um, is uh, the Flink client. I used uh, 100. I think right now it's 101, maybe 102 by now. But before the talk, it was 101. Um, yeah, and then you basically just have to get an execution environment. Uh, it has this um, factory method which will, depending on where you run, get the right execution environment. If you run it in your IDE, you get a local execution environment. If you run it um, in a cluster, you will get um, the respective uh, environment. I don't know how it's called, actually. Um, and then you basically you do your processing lo logic uh, starting from the environment. And if you do streaming, you need to execute um, your program because yeah, basically a stream is a long-running program. Um, if you if you have a batch program, it depends if you have any eager things like um, print to text or print to file. I think it's it's called and or just print. Um, then you don't need to execute. Um, but there are other batch things where you need to execute anyway. Right. Okay. All right. Um, so I mean, Spark won't be that different. Um, <coughs> I mean, every one of you knows Spark, so uh, basically you need just these two um, dependencies to get started. Uh, right now it's one six, I think. Six, one. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, audience participation. Great. Um, the next thing, uh, so basically, if you just want to do something with it, first thing you will need is such a Spark conf uh, where you can set different stuff. Most of it you can also start when uh, provide when starting, but uh, depending if you want to start it in the IDE, it must, might make sense more to, to do like this. The master is actually something you need, so unless you want to provide it a different way, you have to set it here. Uh, that's something where you can set, okay, is it running in a cluster, and if so, where is the master in this cluster, and if not, you can set, say local, and then it will run locally. So you have to provide a bit of information to Spark here, whereas uh, I guess Flink did it by its own, on its own. <clears throat> All right, now depending on uh, which, which uh, API you want to use, you either get a Spark context, or in this case a Java Spark context. So Spark is very nice and always reminds you that you are using Java. Um, all of the classes will have Java in front of it. Um, and basically the other thing you will have is the streaming context, which is also, again, Java streaming context. Um, the interesting thing which you didn't see in Flink is this uh, durations thing here. I mean, yeah, um, it's just because Spark doesn't do really batching, it does uh, streaming, it does micro batching. So basically, you have to decide uh, how big the batches will be that will make your, your stream. So, in this case, you will get a batch each second, and these single batches <coughs> will make your stream of data, basically. Um, this has some consequences, as we will we'll see later on. Um, also, similar to what we have with, uh, with Link, we have in the, in the streaming context, we have to start it. So, once you're ready with whatever you want to do, you have to tell, okay, let's go. Um, most of the time, actually, I forgot a line. You will want to make uh, away termination also, because otherwise, Spark will just will just quit on you. But yeah. Um, all right. So I think that should be enough for this basic part. Um, but we already have some first impressions, uh, some first conclusions. Conclusions. The nice thing about it, I mean, it was like four lines of code, and you basically can get started. Um, so you have practically no boilerplate. I don't know if you. Right, when produce, you will need a little more, a little more code. Um, so that's already a good, good pro for both tools. Um, yeah. The other thing, it's really easy to get started. So basically, with this code, you write your analysis code. Basically, you have a local file which approximates your data. You just start up your IDE, run the program, and you get first res results. Oh yeah, it runs in there. Um, and you get first results. So it's e really easy to get started to play around with it. Um, and yeah, I mean, uh, like I said before, ex at least in our experience, MapReduce is much harder to get into, so running it into, in your IDE is a bit more cumbersome than that. All right, I hope we agree on this. So let's get to round two. Uh, in the second round, we will um, look at both competitors and see how they're doing static data analysis. So basically, what I just showed you in the beginning, uh, we want to combine both static data parts we have and see how we do it in the, in the in both tools. First 
first block again. Okay, now the code starts getting more. Um, so this, this is why I'm using this pointer. I hope you can see everything. I think it's bad for the, for the taping though. Yeah. Well, all right. Um, so the first thing we want to do, we want to load our data, okay? Um, here we use S3. So basically as on the Spark context, uh, you get provided some, some methods which return you um, basically the, the batch, well, the entry point of the batch API, which is this RDD uh, object. Uh, one of those is, is text file, where you can read text files from about anywhere. Um, so here we're using S3. This RDD is something you will see a lot in uh, Spark, unless you're using one of the newer batch APIs. So in this talk, we will focus on the RDD API, not data frames, not data sets, which are pretty new. Um, but we decided to focus on that because that's also underlying for the stream part. So if you have questions about those, uh, sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, and now, with this RDD, we can just start working and start calling operators, start doing stuff. Um, the first thing, we have a CSV file, as we talked before. So now we have two options. If you have a CSV file and use uh, Spark, you can split it yourself, or you can use a third-party library. I probably wouldn't split it myself in production code, um, but for our, for our code, we mostly know what we're dealing with, so I just went this way. Um, the first thing we do is we just split the whole line. We get the, the array back, and then we need to make sure, okay, we had some, some small data corruption built in to make it more realistic. Uh, so we basically filter out anything that doesn't, uh, con uh, con uh, doesn't adhere to what we expect. Um, now comes an um, interesting method, which is called map to pair. This is something you, so if you use uh, Scala, you want to find this method. This is Java only. Um, basically what it does is retur it returns you an RDD, um, which you can run key, key functions on, okay, so reduce by key, stuff like that, so anything where you need to do something on a specific key. Um, basically, what, it's, what it does is just, you return a tuple, um, and you have a key as first element, and then our POJO, which we define here as a second element. And with this, you get this Java pair ID where you can do the key functions. Do, do you have the original CSV file as like, so how does that would be cool, right? Yeah, yeah um, <laughs> unfortunately not. Yeah, uh, <laughs> okay. we'll try to think of that uh, for the next time. But yeah, good point. It basically, has the ID, the name, and the yeah. segment. So okay, well, it's segment yeah, okay. yeah. But you, I mean, you, you met. Uh, yeah, but uh, good point. Good point. We will. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we have a sample output, I think. Yeah, yeah uh, not here. Right? Yeah, we'll <laughs> on the screen, bro. Uh, you, you can come to us later on, <laughs> and we will do something. That's, okay. That's yeah. All right. Um, so. I said we have two input files, uh, so I'm cheating a bit because I'm only showing you one. Uh, the reason is the second is exactly the same, the second part of the code. And now we have two tables. So this one I call it segment table, and now I have a detail table, and now I just join them. This is uh, something that's basically a method pro or an operator provided on the pair RDD. You can just join them, and then you get a tuple with values at least. Um, you get a tuple with basically both, uh, both values you had here. Okay, with both value um, objects. Um, we extract them and we build our new POJO. This is just like what, what, what I showed you on the first slide, where the two were joined and we built a new table out of it. Okay, now comes the part where we really do something with the data. Um, first, we throw away the first, the key. Uh, we just want the, the, uh, this new hero object. <coughs> we filter all uh, out basically everything that is not a human. We are just interested in human superheroes here because we know robots can hit harder. So um, we're not as interesting right now. And the next thing we do, we just save this back to S3 to use it later on in some other scenario. Um, yeah, I mean, this is basically it. Um, it does get a little more, more, more complex later on, so don't be too uh, disappointed. Um, the interesting thing, perhaps, I mean, most of you know Spark, so, but still, for those who don't, um, Spark is lazy. So basically, before this operator, before, before this, nothing will get done. If you comment this out, okay, you will get a compile error, but Apart from that, uh, everything, nothing will happen. So basically, you always you have two kinds of operators. You have this transformation parts, like a map filter, which basically will perform something, but only <coughs> if an action is at the end of it. Okay? Uh, you can, you, there are other operators you can call in between to, to make something happen, but basically this is how it goes. Um, all right, Flink. Right. So Flink will look similar, but a little bit more lean, I think. So, um, basically, Flink uh, just has a read CSV file um, method which uh, gives you the option to ignore invalid lines. 
what does invalid lines mean in this uh, context? Basically, all lines that can't map to the prototype. I uh, um, basically submit here. So um, I also have a segment table uh, class, and then I just um, give it the order of the fields um, in the CSV file. Then basically, I mean, there there are other uh, methods like delimiter and s stuff like that, but um, that's basically it. And then you get back a, actually a data set. I wanted to change that. I mean, you get a data source, but a data source is a data set. So, um, right. So I already have a data set now. The same thing is done for the detail table. Um, and then I just have to do the join. <coughs> Um, I don't need any keys because, um, well, there are no, basically there are no keys needed. <laughs> um, so I, I call join again and then I just say, okay, which, um, which field uh, is the join on? And it's name in both, um, in both uh, POJOs. And in the with uh, part, I just supply the function um, how to join the two um, two records, so S is the segment table record, D is the detail table record, and then I um, instantiate a, a new hero. And again, I have to filter out um, the, uh, the human heroes. Right, and this is, uh, this is it, basically, and then I have a data set of, of heroes. Right. Just a short thing, if you use the data frame API from yeah. Spark, you basically get the same. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So yes. You can read the CSVs, you can join, and yeah. it's much nicer than the RD. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, actually, uh, we have also, uh, so, so I had some slides with uh, data frames API. The problem was I didn't get the CSV import to run with Java. There was a compile error. Actually, you can make it compile with an example from the from GitHub page from the CS CSV parser. But with Scala, it was very easy and very nice. So can actually. But you it's, it's been a while, so we fixed, uh, fixed it probably. But yeah, like I said, I mean, we decided for we decided to skip some parts of the talk because it was too long, and yeah. RDD is important to, to understand uh, streaming later on, so we kept it. Yes. Uh, the hero class is uh, simple pojo. It's yeah. just a pojo, yes. In uh, for Flink, for example, you basically um, a class to be a pojo. You just need a, a dot default constructor and either public fields or just public uh, setters and getters and. Um, Basically, POJOs are in Flink as efficient as um, as tuple, uh, tuples, so they they don't use um, or they use their own serialization method, and can a lot of batch um, batch operations can then be done on the serialized data, like joins and stuff like that. This is possible for tuples, but yes. Uh, right now we are joining persistent data with streaming data. How about joining streaming data? Is there a way to really handle the time intervals? Oh, we, we will get to this later in the screen part, yes. Or at least we can talk about it later, but I think <laughs> part of the question will be in the talk. Um, okay, so, um, all right, right, I forgot to write it back. Uh, so I write it as formatted text. You can only write uh, to CSV uh, from tuples, but I have a POJO. Um, so I have to supply some method how to convert the object to um, um, CSV. Fortunately, the hero has a two CSV uh, method. <laughs> How convenient. Um, okay. And yeah, basically, just can supply any supported uh, file system. Right. So, what about performance? Basically, we, we did some performance tests, um, but it's um, <coughs> we're not publishing them. <laughs> um, we. I'm just quoting some, some performance tests which there are on batch processing between uh, Flink and Spark. Basically, Terrasort and Hash Join, um, you can find some. It's older versions, so not uh, Flink 1.6 and not um, Spark 1.6, Flink 1.0. It's about, I think, one Spark 1.2 or 1.3 or 1.4 and Flink 0.9 or 0.10. So it's just a, an indication <laughs> from an earlier stage. Um, so basically, Flink was was a little bit faster. Basically, most most of the performance um, benchmarks um, said that it's, it's mainly attributed to the um, pipelining. Uh, so Flink does a lot more pipelining between the operators. Um, Spark more blocking. But 
there are also um, benchmarks in which uh, Spark's uh, a little bit faster, or it's comparable. So, yeah, I mean, uh, also the Data Frames API, which you told, is supposed to be very much faster. Um, we haven't had a chance to, 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 I mean, in our test, actually, Flink was still uh, faster, but our tests were not very exhausted, right? So, um, we are still looking for, for good benchmarks uh, up until now. If you have any, please provide it to us. We are very interested in that. Yeah, there's What's another the size of the system in which these tests were run. Uh, I've written it down here. The first one was on AWS, only two slaves with 122 gigabytes of memory. I will, I actually, I have the references in the end, uh, and I think the slides are published. So maybe if I, if I um, let's read it out to you now, it's, uh, it makes a lot of sense. But it's different. The second one was 42 slaves. So, yeah. But you can look it up. We will provide slides and references. The, the last one, it's very old and it's done by the Flink guys and basically, so I just put it in place. So what about the points for the second round? So generally I think uh, Spark and Flink are very comparable in the best part um, in terms of the abstractions they provide. I think Flink has maybe a little bit nicer abstraction because in Spark you have to deal a little bit more about the fact that it's run in a distributed way, so you have to specify number of petitions, stuff like that, um, which, well, you can do that in Flink, and, um, but you don't really rely on it. Um, also, keying and stuff like that, you don't have to do it. Um, generally, Flink also does the automation um, as, uh, basically, it looks uh, on how large is the data, and then it does the petitioning and um, the um, joining based on how your data looks like. Um, I don't think Spark does that. Um, okay, more sugar, yes. Um, but as you said, um, there are other APIs which, which give you the sugar. Um, yeah. That's the same point. And at least in the benchmark, benchmarks we, um, we found, uh, Flink was faster and also in the benchmark we did. It really uh, depends on what you compare. If you compare RDD to Flink, then Spark is really bare metal. But if you compare Data Frame API, you have a full-blown query optimizer like Flink. And I don't know, where, for example, if Flink is employing uh, bytecode generation, for example, which is really speeding up the, the Spark uh, execution, but only if you use this Data Frame. For RDDs, you don't get that. I mean, I, I, but like I said, it's, uh, it would be very interesting for us to also see, uh, see that mm -hmm. comparison. Like I said, we, we had an implementation with data frames of the same, uh, of the same uh, code, but it was, it was lower than, than Flink also. Um, but like I said, it's not exhaustive, so it's yeah. easily possible that, it, uh, that in other implementations uh, Spark will be faster. Um, but everything we heard until now was that Flink is faster. For us, anyway, batch was not the main focus. Um, stream, streaming was not important for us, so we didn't uh, we didn't do a very exhaustive uh, uh, yeah, comparison of the two. But yeah, but, maybe it, but generally, it's, it, it it would be very interesting yeah. to, to see more benchmarks here. Um, but there are there are basically mm. none which which really compare them, and a lot of them are from well the scope of the Flink community. I don't think that. I don't know, Databricks is, isn't really concerned about Flink, so I don't think they, they do a lot of um, benchmarking. Okay, so let's get started with the streaming part. So, our first analysis is basically just total hit points over the last minute, and or over a minute. And here we mean event time minute. So, um, basically you have two, two options to use and then, or you have two concepts of time generally in a streaming program, you have processing time, which is the time at which the stream processor will process the data. Um, and you have event time, which is the intrinsic um, timestamp of the event. So when was the tweet done, when, when did the superheroes hit? Um, so basically we want to do um, Event time, so we, since processing time is the default, we have to um, set the stream time characteristic to event time. 
And then we also have to provide an auto watermark interval. I'm not going into this now, but just that you have to do it. And we can talk about it later, but it's I would have to go into the internals and I don't want to do that now. Um, so basically, then we want to consume from Kafka. So there's a Flink Kafka consumer. Um, in this case, we used um, 0 08 um, Kafka. Uh, so it's Flink Kafka consumer 0 08. And we just uh, basically give it the topic, um, a deserializer, and then the Kafka consumer properties which includes the Zookeeper connection and basically you have to, can put in any um, Kafka consumer properties there. Um, right, and then you get a data stream or a data stream source, which is a data stream um, of byte events because the byte event deserializer um, deserializes the byte array in, the byte array in uh, Kafka to a byte event. So once I, I have this data stream, as I said, I want to use uh, event time so the timestamp which is part of the event. Um, to do that I have to assign a timestamp extractor. Um, I wrote a fight event timestamp extractor 6000 <laughs> and um, what it basically does it, it gets the um, timestamp field as a timestamp and the 6000 um, in this case is it means that once a downstream operator has seen an event uh, with a timestamp t, then no other event with a timestamp lower than t minus 6000 will arrive. So basically it's the maximal delay um, of the events. Because if you don't, you somehow have to provide this, otherwise you can never close windows and um, have to wait forever. Um, yeah, the fight event timestamp extractor is not part of the slides. Maybe we can can send around the GitHub link yeah. later. Yeah. Um, if you want to have a look at the full code. Um, then, as I said, we, we want uh, six, uh, 16 second time windows. We use sliding windows here. Um, so we have a 60 second window and 10 second slide. It's a time window all because the key is not uh, the stream is not keyed or partitioned in any way. So basically, that's not not at all, well, almost not parallelizable. Um, and then we have to supply a function um, what uh, to apply on, on the result of each window. This window function basically gets an, it uh, an iterator on all the events which were in the, um, in the window. And with, well, this sum all window function is also written by me. Um, and you only have to supply the uh, summon of the object you, you want to um, sum on. And then I write it back to CSV. Um, I think it's only the sample output then. So what the sum or window function basically does, it gives you the start of the window, the end of the window, and the total hit points in this, um, in this uh, window. What you can see here, basically the, the first um, number is the parallel instance. I just ran it in the IDE in this case, uh, which has a default parallelism of 8. And so it does parallelize the overlapping windows, but basically, of course, all the events in one window have to go to one machine. So generally, time window all will not scale that good. Um, but that's part of the nature of the program itself. Right. So. All right. Let's get to Spark. Um, Basically, very similar. Uh, we start with our streaming context. Um, okay, I've chosen one second as a, as a, a batch, a micro batch size. Also, here um, we want to get the data from Kafka, so we need to provide some properties. Basically, everything the Kafka consumer takes. Um, and then you have Kafka utils, which are provided by Spark, and you can basically create a stream on it. There are several methods on this Kafka utils. Um, well, this direct stream seems to be the best. <laughs> Um, so yeah, you have to pay attention. I think the other ones are not deprecated, so um, I had some issues with that early on. Um, basically, what you now do is basically provide all the types of uh, of the key and the value you will get from Kafka, and also how to decode them. So, like we said in the beginning, we're using Avro, so basically we had to provide our Avro decoder, which takes uh, basically the message from Kafka and turns it into a fight event. This is pretty basic code. It's um, 
That's, it was very easy to include, actually. Um, yeah, and basically you provide Kafka parameters and also which topics to, to listen on. Um, all right, that's it basically. What you will get out of it is um, an DStream, which is basically the abstraction Kafka uses for, uh, sorry, Spark uses for streaming. Um, again, this will be a pair uh, DStream because we have the key also, and well, Java because Java. Okay, um, again, what will we do with it? The only thing that in uh, that's interests us at this moment are the hit points. So we basically get rid of everything else, just keep the hit points. And then we do the same we just saw in, uh, in Flink, so we reduce by window, and we just sum up both uh, all of the hit points, basically, in all the events. Also here we have a, um, we have a slider window of, two, of 60 seconds, which will basically uh, change every 10 seconds. Uh, the one thing, so I cheated a bit, um, Constantine told you at length that we are using event time for this. Actually, it's not true. Spark only uses processing time, so basically, this windows will only take into account when the events came in. So if the event has a time stamp that is older, well, bad luck. Um, I actually tried to do that. Um, I found some obscure Jira uh, tickets how to, to do that. It was, um, yeah, I don't think they want to enable it in Spark. And it's pretty complicated. If anyone has different experience, uh, please come to, uh, to me after the talk. We can talk about that. But at least I wasn't able to, to do event timing here. I mean, in, in general, I think I can, you can achieve it uh, with map, map with date and basically doing it yourself. Yeah. Um, but um, it's just difficult to um, to do cross um, micro batch stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, it, for sure, it wouldn't have fit on the on the on the slide. Um, I mean, there are some things that micro batching just prevents you from doing. Um, like taking taking just thousand messages basically. Um, this is stuff that's really complicated, much more complicated in Spark than it is in Flink. Um, okay, the next point where this micro batching kind of bleeds through in the Spark API is uh, this forage IDD we use. So basically, um, underlying under the stream is is the, basically the series of RDDs, the batches, which you can access and do operations on. And some operations are just easier to do on the RDDs. So um, at least in my limited experience, maybe, uh, you do it fairly often in Spark. Um, what, what we use it to do is basically save, uh, save this each, each batch as a text file, um, which is basically similar to what we did in the before. So when we do that, we will get out um, this one. So, okay, I made the output a bit, look a bit different, just to stand out. Uh, basically, what you also get is that every 10 seconds, you would get a, the amount of hit points that were scored. Maybe, maybe one, one thing, um, one implication of the event time thing also is that l the latency in uh, Flink will be uh, higher than in Spark here because Flink basically has to wait six seconds at, at the end of every window to be sure to close it. Um, yeah. But that's part of the requirement. Okay, let's see how, uh, how we scored this round. Uh, you may disagree, of course. Um, so Flink supports event time windows, that's cool. Um, actually what we really liked is uh, integrating Kafka and Avro was, uh, well, not, no work at all, so that just works out of the box. Which is fairly cool because I think you want to use Kafka if you do streaming. Uh, Kafka is an awesome tool, I think it's really the standard if you're doing the streaming. So that's, uh, well, that's probably the reason why it's supported so good in both tools. Um, yeah, okay, micro-batching, we, we stepped on that issue before. And, well, okay. Uh, delivery guarantees, that's always a fun topic. Um, yeah, that's something you will hear, hear a lot from your business owners. Um, so, uh, how do you guarantee how many events will all, that all events will arrive? Uh, this is not a simple topic, and uh, the, the easy thing you will get is at least once delivery. So, you will get every message, but some of them will be, well, duplicated or you will get them even more often. So, that's the easy thing, and both of the tools do that easily. That's no problem. Uh, exactly once is a lot harder. You can do it with both, um, but at least once, I th in my in my opinion, at least uh, at least once is a bit of a of a lie because you can't really uh, at least once is not solvable by, by one, one tool, tool only. You need to have it from the first step you have to the last step you have. You need to have all tools running in, in unison to provide at least once. It makes it does does no good if you have one tool that does exactly once, but the next tool will drop and duplicate like uh, like hell. So um, that's 
the first thing I want to say about that. The second thing, even if you can get it done, uh, just in this application you write, a lot of it will depend on the sync and source. So basically, you have, a, you have to have a source of the data which, is, which can replay data that you lost. And you need a sync where you can put data that can just forget data you sent it and you didn't want to send it yet. So um, it's not doable with all tools or interconnections you will have. Um, yeah. Maybe. But I think that's a topic for two different talks, actually. Maybe just a quick, quick addition. So for the sync, of course, if you have an item potent sync, then it's easy. You can yep. just send in multiple records and it wouldn't, wouldn't matter. If you have a non-item potent uh, sync, then basically what you get by exactly once, or what you lose by exactly once, is latency. Because basically um, you have to wait for the next checkpoint or the next micro batch before what you basically uh, have written into the sync, or you can't be sure that it won't be rolled back until the next checkpoint in the case of link will be done. So you can't really do anything with data by a <coughs> downstream application. So if you have checkpoint intervals of one minute and you have a latency of 50 milliseconds, that just doesn't matter because you can't do anything with it. Uh, a short question on the event time windows. Um, can't it just, um let's say, enlarge the window of Spark for that delay that you have in Flink as well and do the filtering on the event times on the RDD directly? Yeah, how, how do you, I mean, you still have the boundaries, right? I mean, but you have a boundary in, in Flink as well. You say you wait, like, additionally... Yeah, but that's, that's a rolling boundary. And in Spark you have to, to make a hard boundary. Or yeah, you could, well, you you could a, do you that. You have a sliding window as well, but it's always a bit bigger. Yeah. It rolls over the data as well, and I just, you know, get rid of the last, yeah. I don't know, the, the, the lag. Like, the okay. lag you have, you would have to do like two, two, two window functions. Uh, mm -hmm. So the first one over the 60s, whatever we had, 60s, uh, and then you can <coughs> add a smaller on one. The, on that window. Yeah, you, it, it's, like I said, it is possible, it's not easy. And uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not built in. Yeah, yeah it's not built in for yeah. sure. and. Um, I think you will run into problems actually. Uh, I don't think it's very, very comfortable or very, very dependent thing to do. Um, but yeah, we can we can maybe discuss it afterwards. Uh, it's uh, kind, hard to, kind of hard to think every, every, everything right, uh, on the, uh, yeah, right, right on here. Spot. Yeah, on the spot. Thank you for that. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, so let's continue. We are running a bit out of time, so uh, I may have to talk faster. Uh, so the, the next one, or the last round actually, so uh, there's hope for you. Um, the last round here will be, we will just try to connect, connect the static data and the, the, batch, uh, the, the streaming data. Uh, which, at, at least for us, was a very interesting use case. Um, so what we want to do is uh, the same we did before, the total hit points over the last minute. But we want to do that per gender. So let's find out who it's harder, girls or boys. Um, in order to do that, um, well, pretty, we'll do pretty, pretty uh, much the same. Um, here, I use, here, this is to read in the, the static data. Uh, I use something different now, so basically I saved my heroes as an object file uh, and read that back. So basically just to, to get around parsing the CSV again. Um, I actually quite like that, uh, that option. Um, I probably I wouldn't do that in production because you don't want to deal with uh, with versions and stuff like that, um, but yes, yeah, so. All right. Um, okay. What we what we do next is basically just pair. I want to, to have the gender more descriptive, so you can see what it is, not just one and two. Um, and that's basically it. I get a pair again. Um, this is just the ID and the gender. So the, uh, the, the hero ID. What we do next is again we have a Kafka stream. Um, we take the value out of it. Um, so so this fight event. And now we take out the hitter ID and the hit points. Okay? So what we do next is this reduce by key and window. Before we just reduced by window. And now we so so we will sum up the hit points for each individual hero over this uh, time span. Um, yeah. So actually this is pretty much what we want to do. And the last part is we want to join in the, the gender bag. Um, again, it's, uh, this time it's pretty convenient that we can go back to the RDD because joining on RDD is something we have already done. Um, so we go back, on our, back down on our RDD, join the gender RDD with our real-time uh, RDD, basically. Um, 
we take out the tuple. Okay, I ah oh, yes, okay. Before I used map uh, map values, so I didn't have to to take both tuples. Now I get a tuple inside of a tuple. Um, yeah, so it's yeah, it looks a bit. Uh, it takes a bit uh, getting used to. Actually, this this tuple class is something is a class out of Scala, uh, so it will look nicer in Scala. <laughs> Uh, but at some points, this Scala API bleeds through even in Java. Um, all right, what we do <coughs> is basically we take the gender. If there is no gender, so basically we have a left outer joint, so it can happen that there is no gender. If that happens, we have an unknown. So actually, our data generator just put in some faulty values to make us really work for our uh, our code, and then we sum the hit uh, basically have the hit, uh, the hit points uh, with the gender basically of the hitter we have. The next thing we do, we just reduce by key. The key is for gender, so basically now we get the hit points for each gender. Um, and this will produce the following output. Um, so basically we'll get, okay, females hit with this many hit points. Others, I mean, ro nah, actually we filtered out robots. Maybe for some you can, ju can just decide, I don't know. Um, yeah, superheroes are pretty progressive, you have to say. Um, and this... Typical topic. Okay. Yeah, okay. And this is... Uh, with other males. Actually, I think the, the difference is just because we have ma more males for heroes in the database. But, um, it is what it is. All right, Flink. All right. So in Flink, that's more, more difficult um, because basically um, in Flink, as I said, you have those separate APIs, data set and data stream API. One for basically distributed streams, the other for distributed um, static data. So and there is right now no way to combine those two APIs. Um, so I think it's on the roadmap, but there's nothing in the snapshot branch at least, or in the master branch. Um, so what, what's the solution right now, or the solution for our use case at least? Basically our, um, our static data is small enough so that we can just load it into memory on each um, task manager. Of Flink, so or actually three times on each task manager. Um, in this case, because we have three operators on each task manager, so I use um, that's actually extending a rich map function. I don't know why it doesn't say so. Um, and this rich the rich map function has um, has an open method which is called before any um, objects are processed. So there we basically just populate a hash map. Um, from ID to uh, the hero object, and I omitted those uh, this this method. It basically, it's just the AWS F3 uh, API, and um, it's fairly long. So, yeah. um, there are ways to do that. So, if, for example, your your data set is too large to fit uh, onto each uh, task manager multiple times, um, there are ways to do that. Basically, you can just load parts of the data into each map and then you have to decide or you have to be sure on it in runtime that you send the right methods to, um, to the right uh, maps which have the respond uh, corresponding static data. So basically you have to do custom partitioning of the data based on how you loaded your data set. But um, yeah, that's nothing I wanted to put on the slides. and. Um, for our case, it's just not necessary because we have, I think, 130,000 um, euros. So that easily fits into uh, memory. So then it's basically, it's pretty easy because, again, we assign timestamps and then we just use this fight event enricher map, um, which <coughs> just takes the, the location of the hero um, CSV and, yeah, and enriches the those events. Then we filter out um, the others. I don't have an others uh, category, I'm just filter filtering out. Um, so if I don't have a hitting hero, it's filtered. Afterwards, I'm uh, keying by gender. I think I could have used um, just field selectors, but apparently I didn't think of it. And um, afterwards, again, the sliding time window. This time, not a time window all, because I'm keying before. And the same uh, sum function, basically, just not a window all function, a window function. That's why it's a different name. 
but that's it basically. Um, and that's the sample output. Ah, I didn't map, map gender either. So it's one for female, I guess, and two for male. Um, yeah, as you can see, it's also it's keyed by uh, by gender in this case. Um, yeah, so only two of the task slots are actually used. Um, right. So performance, even more complicated than. Um, batch performance because basically there are, I know you can read it, <laughs> uh, I didn't find a picture with a higher resolution. Um, there are some benchmarks between uh, Storm and Flink because Storm is just the number one uh, screen processor right now and um, in those benchmarks Flink um, basically beats Storm by an order of magnitude at least in, in, in most of them. I don't know what, happened with, uh, what would happen with Storm 1.0 now, um, but it's still, it's, the gap is still huge. Um, Flink versus Spark, there's basically only one serious benchmark, which, which is the Yahoo screen benchmark. Um, so basically here you see um, the throughput uh, against the latency. Um, as, you, as you might guess, uh, purple is Spark, so the higher the throughput gets, the, um, the higher the latency gets basically because you have to make the windows larger um, or micro batches are queued up um, because basically in, in Spark you always have the problem if the first operator um, takes in too, too many records um, for the batching interval so that the micro batch won't be processed in this one second then you will queue up micro batches that's why the um, throughput uh, gets higher uh, Flink is uh, this one here, so it uh, stays low, and handles the same throughput, so they stopped at 130,000 uh, messages per second. Um, I know the Flink guys, they improved the program together with Twitter and uh, achieved uh, 50 million records per second. Um, unfortunately, the Spark guys didn't do it, um, and also unfortunately, Yahoo just didn't max out everything. Um, I talked to the Flink guys why they don't do benchmarks against Spark Screaming and it's just, uh, they say it's, it's difficult because basically in, in Spark you always have to find exactly the point where the throughput maxes out the micro batch interval. So, um, and if you don't do it exactly right then Databricks will do it a little bit better and then it's like okay you did it the wrong way and you just wanted to, to look better. But I think they did some benchmarks internally, but um, didn't publish anything. I hope there will be more benchmarks soon. Um, so, yeah, just for complete, complete, completeness, Yahoo said um, Spark is supposed or is assumed to handle much higher throughput. I don't know, they didn't, that's all they said about it. Um, so, if any, any of you know any benchmarks uh, for streaming which go beyond that, also very happy. So points. Spark makes it much easier to combine batch and uh, batch and Spark easier. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. It's That's streaming. We wanted to change that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, right. Um, so that's a that's a point for Spark definitely. Um, Windowing by key works well in both, as long as you just use multiples of your batch interval. Um, and actually, I thought of something uh, we should we should talk uh, after. <laughs> um, <laughs> Java API of Spark can be annoying. That's yeah, at least that's my uh, that's my opinion. I mean, if you disagree, you, we can we can talk it out later. But uh, I mean, I used Spark before also with the Scala API. I was I was so much happier with the Scala API. So in, in Java, the Scala API bleeds through all the time. Um, you have methods which are really strange, which you have to use, and you get really strange, uh, strange things you have to do. So for example, I had to return null on one slide. I had to do that because of a very obscure error message like void is not void. Something like that. Um, yeah. So for, at least for me, uh, knowing the Scala API, uh, the Java API was a bit annoying. But your experience made it. Right. Do we have anything else here? No. No, so we conclude. Yeah, we conclude. So uh, it's it will be over soon. Um, let's so 
right now we want to summarize a bit and tell you of our personal impression of the two tools. Like I said, your opinion may very well differ and we can talk it out later on. Um, for us, both are awesome. So we had very much fun uh, well, playing around with both, especially uh, knowing the other tools we know. Um, so we really um, can't say too much bad about either one. Um, both are really nice if you have not only one thing you want to solve, but several things and maybe want to solve them in different ways. So if you want to use batch, if you want to use uh, machine learning, graph, uh, algorithms, anything, you can do it nicely in both and you don't have to change the tool, you don't have to change the programming language. Most of the APIs will look similar, so that's, that's a um, great way. Um, of course, uh, well, whichever tool you choose, your comfort level will, will vary, okay? So if you have a use case where micro-batching just fits like a glove, Spark will be super awesome for you. If you have something with real time, I think it won't be so super awesome. So, I mean, it really depends on what you need, okay? Um, yeah, okay, I told about that, I just want to, don't want to repeat it. Um, but yeah, in the end, the most, what stood out for us most is really working with both is fun. So if you haven't worked with either one, choose one, play around with it, it's cool. <coughs> ah, yes, uh, considering the, uh, yeah, development. Um, yeah. About documentation in open source projects. <laughs> um, there are good ones, like Akka, so if anyone has used Akka, I think they have the most awesome documentation ever. Um, you have others, I won't name the bad, the bad examples, of course. Um, for both of these tools, we actually liked the documentation. It was, it was okay. Um, we had to look up several things in the, in the source code, uh, which didn't, make, didn't become clear from the documentation, especially with Spark and some of the newer stuff like map with state or something like that, uh, the documentation just tells you, okay, this is the method, it's here, and now use it, come on. Um, so there, there could be better, but well, it's an open source project, so yeah, it is like it is. But yeah, we, we, we could get most of what we needed from the documentation and the rest was like mailing lists and looking into the code. You want to go into there? Testing. Yeah, I know, your topic. <laughs> um, Okay, so basically testing distributed systems uh, or unit testing distributed systems uh, I think will always be hard um, because, yeah, I mean, <coughs> separate things fail separately and stuff like that, you know? Um, so at least you, you, need, you need some distributed environment to test on. Um, I think unit testing um, can be done pretty nicely in both uh, tools. Um, you can always uh, just test your operators um, like normal classes. Um, Flink also provides uh, test utils, um, stuff like that. There's also a tool developed by Otto Group, um, Flink Spector, um, which is okay-ish. I think it does a good job, but the API is just not what you use of, uh, of, of Hamcrest or something like that. It just does everything differently of like regular matches, so you have to get used to it. Um, I think it's 0, 0. <laughs> something. So, anyway, um, I don't know, are there similar stuff? So, test usual stuff for Spark? Yes. Yeah, and that's what I already said. So, let's go on. Monitoring, that's basically a snapshot of the Flink um, dashboard um, for a batch program in this case. So, you basically see the job graph as it is um, later executed. You see the parallelism of the um, operators. You see um, which operators are joined together, uh, or yeah, basically uh, joined together, chained together, um, and um, then you basically see uh, which operator runs at which time and uh, how many um, operator, uh, how many elements did it process. Um, you can define accumulators, um, basically uh, like um, MapReduce counters. Um, <clears throat> stuff like that. For a streaming program you have the same thing, you also have checkpoints, you have um, back pressure monitoring, um, well, exceptions, stuff like that. It's, it's still improved I guess, um, but um, I think it's, it's, for example compared to Storm UI, mm -hmm. I think it's before 1.0, I think 1.0 um, in terms of monitoring there were a lot of improvements, but coming from Storm UI, uh, UI party we were um, was a nice surprise, especially the numbers actually add up. Uh, in Storm, it's always best effort, I guess, um, to put in the right number there. Um, 
Spark. Yeah, I mean, um, I actually I like the Spark UI. Um, still do. You can see a lot of stuff in there. Um, we've been using Flink for some time now, so I've got, gotten used to the Flink UI, and I like it a lot, lot better now than Spark UI. But it might just be something of getting used to. Um, yeah, I mean, I got some weird errors actually in the Spark UI, so I, I didn't get any of that for, for Flink, so maybe that's also my perso personal experience. Um, but I think I think the Spark UI does a well, good job, and you can see everything you uh, you, you need to from it. From it. Um, the next thing you want to look at is for an open source, it's kind of an uh, open source project, it's kind of important uh, how the community looks like. And I think it's no big secret that the, um, that the Spark community is one of the strongest uh, in open source projects overall ever. Um, and um, I think we just took a screenshot of OpenHub. Um, and comparing the two tools, I think on the, which one is bigger? Actually, on the right, Spark is on the right. Actually, yeah, I, I thought I did and I put them um, uh, Okay, there. actually, these are old, old numbers, ignore them. We have newer ones, we will update the slides and put them on. Uh, but basically, you can see everywhere just, uh, just Spark has more developers or more co contributors, more commits, more everything. But still, Flink is a very active project. We have lots of uh, contributors also. Um, and um, I think it can really hold its own. I mean, it's not Spark. Spark, I mean, there are very big companies behind Spark, right? I mean, uh, Databricks, Caldera, what you name. Um, Flink doesn't have that yet, but still, as an open source project, if you compare them with smaller ones, you will see that they have comparable numbers and uh, it looks very stable. So it's, it's a healthy open source project, for sure. Okay, um, yeah, so if you come up to us and tell us, okay, great talk, guys, um, but now which two do I choose? Um, well, we are consultants, so, um, yeah, you know, it depends. Um, it's a hard question, because it, everything depends on what you do, what problems you have, right? Some problems you will be able to uh, solve better with Spark. For example, so, we have some short, sort of short pointers when you might get, be happier with Spark or Flink. So with Spark, you might be happier if you already have a Hadoop cluster or a Hadoop distribution, like, uh, Odeva, Hortonworks, MapR, what you have. Um, you have the support, the paid support for that, and you really use that paid support. Because the cool thing about that is you get good support for Spark 2. And that's of course something that, especially the big clients and big companies uh, might like. And it looks like, I talked to the Flink guys, and it doesn't look like Flink is getting in there, well, in the next half year, I guess. Um, so, so yeah, if maybe you... MapR, the first, Cloudera, the last, and Hortonworks somewhere in the middle. But I think Hortonworks, they, they took in Spark too, too early and had prob prob problems, so they will be a little bit more conservative, conservative now. Um, okay. I mean, it's of course really cool if you have a distribution and you can just simply install uh, Spark and everything runs, compared with Flink where you have to, have to set up everything, which is not so complicated, but well. Basically, yeah. You have to submit the job. Yeah, 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 you have to install some. One or two parts, but that's it. Okay, um, actually, if you want to use uh, the graph and machine learning algorithms, um, Spark is way ahead. You just have to say it like that. Flink also has these libraries, but it's more, it's not a, not a very big focus right now. First, they want to make sure that we nail the Spark and Batch, uh, stream and Batch, gods, every time. All right, uh, streaming and Batch, and uh, graph and ML, it's there, it's usable, but it's still uh, beta, so. Uh, Especially ML. I think graph is. Okay, has been used for serious projects, yeah. but I'm not. Yeah, and Spark is just way ahead, and uh, if you want to use that, so use Spark. Um, yeah, of course, the thing is, Spark is older, it has more contributors, more money behind it. Um, it's supported by everyone you can name, probably, and um, it's just the older project, the more mature project, the pro project where more stuff is already fixed. Not to say, but Flink is, immune, uh, is in a beta state where everything will crash while you put it in production. That's not, not the case at all. It runs actually pretty nicely. But still, uh, there's more manpower behind Spark and some stuff is just uh, far more evolved. Basically, if you have a problem in Spark, you will find the Stack Overflow question. If you have a yeah. problem in Flink, you will, well, I say 50% of the cases, you will be the first one. And um, then you basically write to the mailing list and um, get help there. But um, 
Okay, so that was uh, the flint use cases. Uh, the spark use. Oh, God. Okay, it's time to uh, for the talk to finish. Yeah, I think if you want to do serious screen processing, you shouldn't use Spark um, because it's just not much meant for screen processing. Um, I think the batch, uh, the micro batch architecture is uh, fundamentally flawed. You could say, <laughs> yeah, because basically you have to start a whole batch program every second, for example, and uh, that just takes time. If you have a large program that's hundreds of operators, um, you have to initialize every time, and you can really deal with varying throughput uh, in a production use case. As far as or at least that's what, what I heard from production users. They, they were struggling a lot. Um, sure, I'm open to other opinions and I, I will take them into consideration. Um, if you rely on complex window operations, so beyond, um, beyond time windows, beyond count windows, you can do a lot more with window. You can do session windows, stuff like that. That will just be very hard um, in uh, in anything else than a real screen processor. So I guess that's also possible in Storm, but Storm is just slower. Um, right, if you only develop in, in Java, then I think Flink is also the better choice because um, you will have to look at the code and um, Flink you will look, uh, look at a lot of Java code and Spark you will um, very soon look into Scala code, which you might not understand as good as the Java code. If you want to support a German project, um, <laughs> then you should also use Flink. Um, it's also nice from the point of view that um, you can actually, um, the people uh, in Flink, they are um, very open to, to input in terms of uh, features you need and stuff like that. So um, basically you, you, have to, um, you have an option to um, shape the project. Um, in the early stages. And actually another point is, um, I mean, this seems like a, like a trivial point and like a joke we built in the, uh, for the last slide, um, but actually it has some, some interesting side effects. For example, the core brains behind the project are in your time zone, which is fairly nice if you get uh, replies to your pressing production problems uh, during your business hours. Mm -hmm. So it has some nice perks that you didn't think of first, uh, but we, which we're quite happy with. And also, I mean, it's it's just nice for not every cool project to come out of Silicon Valley, right? Um, yeah, just our opinion, of course. <laughs> I think for uh, as you as you might have guessed by now, um, we ended up with Fling. Um, that's um, basically the main reason I think is we do mainly screen processing, and um, yeah, that's um, so the first part was probably the the most important. What is the original use case? Um, well, I don't know how, how much I can tell you about it, actually, uh, but... Our use case or... Uh, well, obviously, yeah. where you ended up with Blink, it yeah. was not about superhero fighting. <laughs> that, that is true. No, it's a actually, uh, yeah, we, so it's a project for a customer, so of course we have some, some NDAs we can't really talk about. But uh, like Constantine said, it's very streaming heavy, so we process... It's like IoT or which kind of... No, no. It's, it's, event it's, it's event events, it's real-time events which we process basically. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, scale yeah. is about 4 million records a day. Um, for billion. For billion uh, records yes. a day. Um, yeah. Price. Um, and, and we do have to do some uh, yeah, heavy operations, so we also have some study <laughs> data parts which we need to join later on into the stream and stuff like that. So we have, we have a lot of similar use cases that we had here, um, but like I said, streaming is the most important for us. Uh, uh, part for us. Funny thing though, we started actually our first print project we brought, or application we brought to production was actually batch. So we started off with batch, even though play, uh, streaming is the more important one for us. But we have Flink and streaming. And actually, stream that was the reason. It was kind of a test. Yeah, because actually, we didn't want to use the important one. Uh, yeah. Test. yeah, also we knew Flink would do good in, uh, in streaming and we wanted to look how it performs in batch. I think, uh, as far as I know, it's a it's known implementation. Um, um, I think uh, data artisans or Flink, they had a um, last week or something like that. They had a, um, a blog post about um, their complex event processing um, framework. It's basically, I think, their number one focus right now in terms of uh, libraries. Um, you can probably find, find more information there. Yeah. I just one, one last question. Um, 
there are two uh, competitors that are the stream market, but uh, you mentioned you use Kafka. Nowadays, Kafka has its own uh, stream, uh, stream processor called Kafka Streams, available with a confirmed package. So, uh, did you have also a look on that? Uh, because if you are just talking about mainly streams and not much of the batch and stream stuff, and perhaps um, it could be the, let's say, the easiest for solution. Mm, so yeah. You're talking about Samsung, I guess. No, no, with Kafka. No. Oh, Kafka, Kafka is it's own AI. Yeah, um, actually, um, yeah, we were most interested in, in, in streaming because that's where a lot of our stuff happens. But we have a lot of batch stuff ha going on, which we also needed to, to handle. And like I said in the introduction, before, at the, well, at the beginning of, of, the pro of our involvement in the project, it was a big zoo of all the tools there were, like Scoop and Hive and Pig and MapReduce and everything you can have. So basically our main focus was uh, to, to lower the complexity of the tools used and just find out if there's one tool that can do it all. So yeah, of course, uh, if, if we would have found out that uh, the stream, Flink streaming is slower than more specialized um, tools, we would probably prefer the more specialized tools. But uh, if we have the option to have a great streaming tool that also is, is good for batch, mm -hmm. that's of course, in our eyes at least, uh, the preferable option. Yes? Um, you come to example, you have a join and then you make some aggregation. Yeah. Say, <coughs> say I want to add some more uh, aggregation or some different stream processes. Is it possible to perform a query sharing and thing? Or do I have to set up a new stream processor for each new idea I have? I, th I think the, well, basically if you want to do something completely different, um, no, then I you want to use a, or reuse partial results of the stream processing, but for new aggregations or new joins or whatever. But, uh, so, so it means using something like an interactive shell or something where you can provide new code? Or uh, let's say I join them, then I make an aggregation for yeah. some, yeah. and then I well, make an average or join it with a, another stream, yeah. and I don't want to well, actually do the join again with the same data because mm. I already did it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the question is, what do you do with the data? So basically, what you can do, of course, is put it into a Kafka or something like that, and then you can, of course, reuse the data that's stored there at least. Not everything. No, I, I think I think the question is actually about the code, right? So, I mean, every operation returns some data stream again, and then you can reuse the stream. You can uh, oh, okay. you can basically yeah. loop over it and start a new stream that start end streams from this one stream. Um, yeah, then no, basically the graph will just branch out. Okay, but I, then I have to use the last view actually. I cannot just say, okay, I um, break the graph of processing, reuse some partial results, and uh, process them again. I mean, generally, you, in a streaming program, it, you, you usually you don't have a start and an end. So then you would have to do a window, and the result of the window, of course, you can uh, pipe into an or use as an input for a different processing stream and the original stream you can still process beside the window where you did the aggregation in or something like that. Um, so I think in terms of the logic, a lot of possible if you want to do it interactively while the stream is running, you basically think the best solution is some kind of a con control stream and then you have some kind of co map where you have the cons control screen with your commands mm -hmm. coming in and you change and then you have some logic how to do how to manipulate the original stream based on your cons control screen events. Uh, but that's yeah. probably not what you meant. <laughs> if it, it didn't get clear we can talk about it later on if you like. Um on resource versus standalone. Have you tried it out? Um, what about uh, running Spark and Flink together at their strings on the cluster, for example? Um, um, we actually didn't. So we, for this example at least, we focused on on the Yarn deployment into EC2. That uh, and actually, stand alone. Was stand alone. Stand alone. Sorry, yeah. But um, in production, we're using Yarn because it's yeah. just the most flexible, um, and we knew, we need HDFS and everything else anyway. But um, how stable was that? On yarn? Yes, so, for example, yarn did kill the, um, the application master. Um, Does it happen? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there are still, as, as far as I know, there are some problems um, with Kerberos uh, 
if you use Kerberos. Um, without Kerberos, um, no, I, I mean in terms that, I mean, of course there were problems, but um, that there were, it was just killed, the, the job manager, so the, the Flink master, that, that's not the case. Um, I think both, both have uh, job manager high availability um, in, in the yarn setup as, as, well as, a, um, as well as a standalone setup. Um, that yarn itself, in, so it, I mean, yarn does not kill, kill the application uh, to free up resources. Uh, that's what you mean, but... Uh, but we also didn't manage to, to use Flink to kill yarn, so that didn't happen no, that also. Um, I think that might, might be the two, questions, two, two answers to your question. I mean, we, we tried it out and um, depending on uh, the amount of memory given, strange things would happen. Okay. So okay. We, maybe, maybe we can talk about it later on. Uh, that, that's very interesting for us. <laughs> Alright, any more? Yeah, you want to. Uh, you mentioned that it's a bit difficult to combine batch and uh, stream processing with a uh, flink. Therefore, I'm wondering why uh, didn't you uh, look at uh, using a specialist uh, batch processing and a specialist uh, stream processing uh, system instead of flink? Um, I think I think the main reason is we we have this application which is um, pretty distributed, not not. A, Every tool is distributed, but everything is distributed among different data centers and stuff like that. A different tool anywhere. And um, our m main goal was to unify it, to make it easier. Um, and so basically that, that was the reason. Of course, we, we could have used a specialized batch processor, but um, Flink is fast for batch processing too. So why do it? Yeah. Um, we actually don't have so many use cases where you need to combine batch and, and stream. And for both, you can you, you manage to get to get solutions which work work pretty good. So um, sometimes yeah, I was just wondering yeah, yeah, because of course, you yeah. said uh, yeah, yeah. Spark is better for batch processing, yeah. Storm is better for yeah. uh, stream processing, and you just use the compromise. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think um, the, the choosing a tool for any problem will be a compromise uh, uh, anyway. I think actually for this, uh, if this was our use case with this three uh, scenarios we had, probably I don't know if we would have chosen Flink actually because because of what you said. If if it's really so so important or one of the central points to to join batch and stream, this is easier in Spark. If we need event time, okay, it goes back to Flink. So it's a lot of things you have to take into consideration. And like like we said, the main the main point we wanted to have is to have less tools. So. If, if it's possible to do it in a good way, uh, without compromising basically much, <laughs> uh, and use just one tool, that's the ideal option for us. It might, of course, differ in a different use cases. That's, that's true. Um, what you said, um, we, we didn't say Storm is a better screen processor, because it's, in my opinion, it's definitely not. Um, uh, we I still see. use Storm in production, yeah. and we will definitely um, use Flink at some point. Yeah. We'll re rewrite it, because Flink is faster, Flink gives you a Better abstraction, it has better guarantees. It's, I don't. If if you look at if you look at um, Spark 1.0, basically half of the uh, Storm 1.0, basically half of the stuff is um, basically features Flink have right away, and they try to adapt it. Um, so um, event time windows Storm 1.0 basically done like Flink uh, synchronous uh, check. Uh, this barrier snapshots, uh, so the checkpointing mechanism is flink. Um, a lot of stuff is flink. So, um, yeah, I think it's the fundamentally better uh, screen processor. It's not as m production um, wow. proven, but um, we had problems with Storm in production too. So, I don't know. Actually, up to this point, I think we had much more pr problems with Storm than we had with flink. Um, uh, Storm is evolving, of course, so we can't really tell, uh, talk about version 1.0, which is supposed to be better. The red flag that was raised for me was that uh, Twitter, which basically was behind Storm for a very long time, uh, decided to abandon it and tried a new tool. So that's the point where I started to question if Storm might not be uh, over its speed. I don't know. But like I said, they are still doing stuff, and uh, Storm is, of course, uh, worth with considerations. Um, 
if that's what you need. It's, uh, for our use case, that is think was worth it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Maybe we just take it offline and yeah. uh, drink a beer. I think that that sounds like a good good compromise. If you uh, don't want to talk to us outside, you can also write us an email or reach us via Twitter. Um, like I said, we will publish the slides, so you don't have to write it down right now. Um, yeah, I hope. Uh, also, if you think we, we missed any aspects and stuff like that, we're very yeah, happy about totally. the feedback and um, anything we should include uh, in the future, or, um, just stuff we didn't know. Yeah. So, yeah. All in all, uh, I would like to thank you for your patience. <laughs> Um, and yeah, thank you for being here.